Our next DevOps stalwart, ladies and gentlemen, is an internationally renowned cloud and DevOps transformation and strategy executive and thought leader. He's the author of the award-winning bestseller, The DevOps Adoption Playbook and DevOps for Dummies. He has been a keynote speaker at various prestigious global IT conferences. Apart from being a former IBM Distinguished Engineer, he is considered to be an inspiring industry thought leader for key trends of DevOps and cloud, and emerging trends of containers, microservices, and site reliability engineering. He is currently leading the team delivering application delivery and innovation platform at Truist. Today, he will share his thoughts on DevOps, cloud, and democratization of security. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me utmost pleasure to now welcome on our screens the one and only Mr. Sanjeev Sharma. Hello, everybody, and welcome to my session. My name is Sanjeev Sharma. I'm a principal analyst at Accelerator Strategies and author of the books, The DevOps for Dummies and DevOps Adoption Playbook. Dang, it's not a good, day, good start when you forget the names of your own books. So uh, for those of you who might not know me, I've been in the DevOps space since the early days. I think I did my first ever client engagement around DevOps back in 2012. And I've been in the DevOps space for uh, you know this entire time, working in cloud and DevOps and helping some large organizations around the world with their DevOps adoption journey. And that's what I ended up writing about in my, on my blog and, and in my two books. And today I work as a principal analyst, as I mentioned, with Accelerator Strategies. We are a boutique analyst and advisory firm based here in the U.S., but, you know, engage with clients all over the world. So uh, if you have any questions later on about what I do and what I'm working on, uh, feel free to ping me later on. Uh, after the session, uh, my contact information is actually on the last slide. So what am I talking about today? As you probably heard from, you know, our host Neladri and other speakers, the theme of uh, this DevOps India Summit, and I'm very excited to be participating in the second one. Last year, of course, we were all in person. My second one uh, is, is, is around DevSecOps, right? The role of security. And my topic, you know, let me go back one slide, is about the democratization of security as we move to a DevOps cloud-centric world, right? The role of security is changing. And security, I mean, you know, security in broad, right? We all hear people say, you know, hey, security is everybody's job. What does that mean? Well, that when they say that, it... As a user, at then user, it means, you know, don't click on phishing links, you know, be careful of what website you go to, don't install, you know, software. But what does it mean for a practitioner in the DevOps space or the DevSecOps space, right? And uh, that's what we'll talk about today. And how can, how, how can the InfoSec teams and the DevOps teams work together to create today what is referred to as DevSecOps? So we'll talk about that. So that's kind of uh, my agenda here, right? I'm going to talk about the evolution of delivery practices very briefly. I mean, this is a DevOps, uh, you know, conference. So, you know, I don't need to introduce DevOps here to anybody, hopefully. Uh, other people have done that or you already know about it. If not, you know, read read my books. Uh, we'll talk about what is what do I mean by the word democratization in the context of application delivery. Then we'll talk about security in today's world and, uh, you know, introduce you to a term which you might not have heard before, might have heard before, called security chaos engineering, right? And uh, how does how does this new concepts around chaos engineering fit in the security world? And, and, talk, and talk about uh, what next, right? How do you get started? If you want to adopt what I'm talking about today or at least embark on that journey, where do you get started? You know, and a technique I use very often when I'm working with my clients or helping with, you know, a company I might be working for is, is a value stream mapping. Again, as I said, I'm not going to spend time today talking about DevOps because, you know, if you are here, you should already know about it or you will learn more. And there are many other people who are going to talk about some basic fundamentals. My focus is on the security side. But I have a very, but I want to set the context, right? I want to set where I'm coming from. I have a very simple view of DevOps, right? I'm not talking about the definition of DevOps, but the end goal of DevOps. When I'm, when I'm working with clients or when I'm helping a company I'm working with or working for, adopt DevOps, what am I trying to do, right? And there are a lot of terms being, you know, used in DevOps, right? You know, CI, CD, is CI, CD, continuous delivery or continuous deployment. We will put that all aside for a second. But let's look at from the context of a company, of a business, what are we trying to do when we adopt DevOps, right? We are trying to continuously improve four things. And those are the four bullets on this slide. 
First, we are trying to improve the system or the application which we are delivering. Whether we are delivering just a module or a service or a complete application or a massive system, we are trying to improve it. So in every, every release, every sprint, every iteration, whatever term you want to use, it's better than the last time, right? We learn from feedback we get from the customers who are using it. That's why the feedback you know, box at the end of the slide is very important. And we improve it. The second thing we improve is the platform which we use to deliver it, right? What do I mean by platform? The platform includes the infrastructure, includes all the environments, the production environment and the non-production environments, and all the tools we used, right? Whether we use the planning tool or issue management tool or a code repository or artifact repository, a CII tool, a build tool, a CD tool, a testing tool, whatever tools we used, whatever platform we used for our software delivery lifecycle to build our pipeline, we improve that, right? We learn about, you know, it's like the Toyota way, right? You, if that is a, uh, the, the delivery pipeline, which is, you know, the equivalent of an assembly line in a car factory, can be improved in a certain way. Are you improving it based on what you learned as you are delivering software? The third is the process by which it is improving. So we're not just talking about the, 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 the tools, but also the processes, right? Maybe the tools are great and they can do many more things, but your process is horrible, right? Process is too manual or has too much waste in it, right? How can you improve it? And lastly, how can you improve the culture of the organization delivering it? You know, we've always talked about this since the early days of DevOps, that DevOps has more to do with culture than it has to do with, uh, you know, with tools and technology, right? If your culture is not appropriate, if you're not having a culture of trust and communication and collaboration, or it is very top-down management where there is no, you know, uh, decision-making capability or no improvement capability left with the end practitioner, you have the wrong culture, right? How can you improve the culture so that people don't get burnt out, people get empowered, people learn? And the person closest to the code, whether they are writing the code or testing the code or deploying the code, the person closest to the code who has the most information about the code is the person being able to improve the code. And code can be at any level, right? Everything is code nowadays, right? Code can be the code in the application, the code can be the code implementing your security, the code can be the code implementing your you know, CI, CD pipeline, the code can be your infrastructure as code, code can be configuration management as code, everything is code today, right? The person closest to the code, the culture should allow that person to be the one improving, you know, the other three things. Now, of course, DevSecOps has become a new term, right? I am personally actually of the belief that there should be no DevSecOps as a separate term. If you do DevOps right, security and InfoSec should be a part of your DevOps team, uh, you know, life cycle. Everybody should be included in your squads and tribes or whatever teaming model you're using including security, so why call DevSecOps out? The reason DevSecOps exists at the time because that didn't happen. Security got left as an afterthought, right? And security and compliance, and, as, and in, in the SEC piece, I include security and compliance, are a big issue now, right? And you've seen, you know, you've seen some numbers there, and these are probably old numbers, right, from 2018, talking about the, the how many records were exposed, right? I mean, just this week, I got a letter in the mail saying, I don't know why they send it by mail saying, Hey, your account in such and such company was, you know, we had a breach and we would offer you, you know, uh, credit monitoring for a year. Right? It's normal, right? It's not a question of have you been hacked. It's a question of did they find it, find out that you've been hacked, right? And the sentiment today is for most organizations, and I'm using Tim Cook's quote here, is that companies need to become custodians of their users' data, which means everything should be secured by design. Everything should be secured at every aspect, not just in production, but also in your non-production life cycle areas. And that brings us to this concept of democratization. So before I go into democratizing security, let me step back and talk about what I mean by democratization, right? And I've used this analogy before, if you heard me present before, this is a very slight kind of goes nowadays into a lot of my presentations, because I think it's a theme which explains, it's an, I like analogies and this one explains things very well. And usually, and fortunately tennis is a sport which is understood by most people around the world, right? I mean, if I was talking about football, Right. The first question would be American or, you know, the rest of the world football, which one am I talking about? Tennis is generally understood. And I'm only talking about rackets. Right. So tennis rackets have evolved a lot. I remember when I started playing tennis back in the 70s. Right. I got my I took my dad's racket. And it was the laminated wood racket, the one from the which shows 1947. It was invented. Right. It was heavy, man. We got a lot good workout, you know, just swinging it around. Right. But tennis rackets have evolved a lot. And today tennis rackets are made of composite materials, they're very light, you can spin, you can control the tension of the of the strings very easily. But what I mean by democratization is not only has the technology improved, but the technology has become accessible to everybody, right? So today, my son, whose picture you see, 
uh, on the bottom right of the screen there. And this picture is a couple of years old. He's you know, a college student now. He can actually go and play with the same tennis racket with Roger Federer, who's you know one of the top players in the world plays with, right? And it did not cost us an arm and a leg. The racket wasn't cheap, but it was easily accessible. We ordered it two days later, it was at home. And you know, I didn't need to take out a bank loan, right, to order it, right? Whereas if back in my day when I was playing in the 70s and the 80s, if I wanted John McEnroe's specialized racket, it would be special ordered, probably cost a lot of money. Maybe probably my parents would have argued for months to, to let me buy it because it was so expensive. That's democratization, making things available and accessible. So if we take this concept and apply it to DevOps, what we are doing is democratizing all the capabilities in an application delivery pipeline and making it available to the practitioner who needs it, right? So we are democratizing infrastructure and making it available to uh, a developer who needs to provision, self-service provision a dev environment, right? But to a QA professional who needs to you know, uh, provision a test environment or, or a QA profession, uh, pro, uh, a professional who needs to, uh, you know, uh, hydrate their test environment with some test data, right? So do they need to open a ticket? To how do they do it today? They open a ticket with a DBA who then once he or she gets to it, you know, makes a copy of the data and puts it as uh, in, your, in their test environment. Why not make that self-service, right? Why not make the technology accessible via code so that an API is right, essentially, whereas a test QA professional can push a button and say, you know, this is the data I need. This is how I want it sanitized. So I'm not exposing any privacy information. So please mask or obfuscate all these fields and make this available in my test environment. I run my tests. I'm done. Please make that data, data you know, go away. That's democratization. The same way we're going to focus on today, the concept of democratization of security. And in other presentations I've done in the past, you know, you can Google them up or look them up on you know, uh, you know, YouTube or my blog, and you know, I've talked about the rest of those democratizations. Today, we're focusing on security. What does democratization involve? In order for us to democratize technology, four things need to happen. The first thing is that that technology needs to available be available as self-service, right? If I need to open a ticket to get access to something, it is not democratized, right? Because it's not self-service, right? Uh, you know, if I need a ticket and have somebody else do something, it is def definitely not democratized, right? And which is Typically, the way it is, right? When I was, you know, I remember working as as a developer, you know, several years ago, many many Linux versions ago, and the only way I could get a dev environment, a dev server in those days, not even a full environment, was by opening a ticket. I opened a ticket, and you know, a few days later, I got a got an email saying a dev server had been provisioned for me. It was on some data center somewhere, and it was a blank server, it just had OS on it, and I had to then install everything. You know, set up my environment, took, took me a couple of days and help from five other people. That's not self-service. The second requirement is that then it needs to come with permission to act. What good is self-service if I don't have permission to use it and I still need to, you know, open a ticket with my with my manager or some supervisor or team lead to get, get permission to be able to act on what is available via self-service. And I've seen that happen also, right? I've seen, gone to clients and they said, oh yeah, everything is automated self-service, but we have a five-step manual approval process, which everybody needs to go through before they can provision anything. Well, that defeats the purpose, right? So it needs to come with permission to act. But both of these also require guardrails, right? Permission to act and self-service shouldn't create chaos. And we'll talk about chaos engineering later, but chaos engineering is controlled, right? Guardrails say that my self-service, my ability to do something comes with some controls, comes with a well-guarded uh, pathway which I can go on so that I don't break anything and I don't expose my company to anything either, right? I'm not provisioning unsanitized, unobfuscated data to a, you know, unprotected, uh, you know, test environment, uh, you know, outside of my country. Now I'm like not only, you know, exposing uh, customer privacy data uh, to, you know, the public, uh, for somebody hacker to come and get, but I'm also probably breaking, you know, some, you know, compliance requirements like GDPR or CCPA by putting data, moving customer data outside of my country. So, you know, these are important. These are examples of guardrails, right? So those guardrails protect me, protect the company, and also create a role-based access control to allow me to do something or not do something based on my role in the company, right? And what permissions I should have. So those are guardrails. And those guardrails need to evolve over time, right? As the company gets more mature, you can relax some of the guardrails. You know, the road can get a bit wider. The guardrails can give some leeway, right? Some shoulder on the road before you hit the guardrail. So people can, you know, breathe easily. All of this should create, come with an environment of trust. All of this will only work if everybody trusts each other, right? The people providing the service trust the end users, the, the consumers of the service, right? So the, the infrastructure team trusts the developer to say, you know, they're not going to willy-nilly create 
crazy environment. So, so the guardrails are there to protect them, but they, you know, they trust them to say they're not trying to break the guardrails or work around it, right? Same way, as a practitioner, now I'm trusting that when I ask for test data and it's must, it is must. So I can provision it to a, you know, a, a, a server somewhere without having to worry about, you know, uh, will, is this properly protected? So those, you know, that trust is mutual and all of these kind of tie them together. This is, in my opinion, what is true democratization. And this needs to happen across all IT services. But in today's context, we'll talk about security. So democratizing security is not easy, right? First of all, it's a cultural aspect to it, right? Because there is, you know, the InfoSec teams want control and I don't blame them because they also have the responsibility. I remember meeting with the CISO of a very large retailer here in the US. This was probably five, six years ago. And I was sitting down with him and we were, I was doing an assessment. So I was actually interviewing him. And, and then I said, what is your number one goal? What is your number one goal as CISO? And it was fairly new in the job. And he said, uh, not getting my name in the Wall Street Journal is my number one goal, right? He's like, nobody should know who I am, right? I mean, I don't want to exist, you know, in anybody's, uh, any new, any reporter's, you know, uh, you know, phone. And he said, that will only happen if we have a breach. If we have a breach, given our reputation, our size, I'll be on the, we'll be on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, and my name will be there as the guy who failed the company. So responsibility is obviously there with the security team. So they need to do it very cautiously and very, in a very controlled manner, right? So yes, security needs to happen at every level. You need to secure uh, four bullets, which you see in the you know, bottom left corner. They talk about what needs to be secured. You need to secure those four things, which I talked about earlier, on, right? To secure the application or the system you're delivering. You need to you secure the platform which you're using to deliver it. You need to secure the processes. What do we mean by that? You need to, while creating a process, while refining a process, you need to keep security in mind. You need to think, you know, in a, do you know red team like exercises and say, and we'll talk about chaos security engineering. You can do table type exercise with processes and say, if I do this, what could go wrong from a security perspective? And that's a cultural thing. That culture needs to be ingrained in everybody's mind that security is your problem now, also. You know, and it is your responsibility also. The security team is going to, you know, give you some democratized capabilities which you can use, but you should use them. They, sh they are not optional. And that culture has to come of shared responsibility. So manage security like code, you know, and we are seeing more and more tools today now evolve to a level where they have APIs. These are security tools where have APIs where our developers can, can, can use them to search and detect and mitigate vulnerabilities. Right, right from the beginning. So security is becoming more self-service because of those APIs, right? Everybody writing, you know, developing with containers today knows that they need to run, you know, a con container vulnerability analysis, right? Everybody writing code today knows they need to run certain test security tests to validate that they haven't put in any backdoors or, or vulnerabilities in their code, right? But security also needs to kind of, you know, become technology stock agnostic, right? It becomes very complex for the end users if, they are being asked to use tools they are not familiar with. So security needs to become technology agnostic, but also needs to be better integrated and better usable, consumable by uh, by the practitioners, whether they're developers or testers or infrastructure uh, engineers, right? And a lot of automation needs to come in, right? A lot of infosec teams are very concerned today about automation, but they realize that they cannot keep up. Right. So we are seeing this trend towards autom automated detection and mitigation and the AI and machine learning spaces helping a lot here is becoming very important. And that should not just exist in production, but through the entire application delivery lifecycle. So even in a test environment, right? why not run those automation de vulnerability detection scripts, uh, you know, or machine learning models and algorithms which are looking for you know, behavior which can be detected as rogue behavior and you know, catch and mitigate that well before you get to production. And this is not easy. We understand this. Nobody is saying this is easy. There's high complexity, there's high cost, and there's, there's multiple demands, right? Businesses want speed, right? But businesses have come to the realization that you cannot move fast and break things, right? That doesn't work anymore. So they have to be done in a secure and compliant manner. Compliance itself has become very expensive because you're layering more and more compliance, right? There was GDPR. You know, here in the US, we have CCPA. It's only in California, but really, how can you assure, you know, it really applies to any company which might have a customer in California, right? I mean, it's not a country, it's a, it's a state and those borders, you know, you know, they are well-defined, trust me, but, you know, they are they impact everybody, right? Any, any, any user, any company anywhere in the country can have a customer in California. And, you know, and more importantly, this is not the end, right? We all know that this is just the first salvo and the compliance regimes are getting more and more cumbersome. And we also know that, 
you know, the hackers are getting better, right? The breaches are getting more prevalent, right? And, you know, it's not a question of will I get hacked, but when? So how can you have to handle all those complexities and all those demands all at the same time? And, you know, the data sets we have to deal with and protect are getting bigger and bigger. And more and more ephemeral storage is getting more ephemeral with this whole move towards containers and Kubernetes and all. And scaling in the adoption in the enterprise is even more difficult, right? Because you have multiple technology stacks, right? You have all these big stacks, which are, you know, as a, as a, as a IT industry, we are great at adopting new technology, but terrible at retiring old technologies, right? You know, I look at organizations and they'll have seven, eight different technology stacks, all working interrelated with each other, right? You know, a Salesforce app is calling something, um, an application running in some really old version of WebSphere or WebLogic, and that is in turn calling something on the mainframe, which is you know running really cool technology, but uh, people look at it differently just because you say the word mainframe, it can be the you know latest, coolest technology. All these are interrelated, that's what those circles and lines are supposed to represent. And these interdependencies, unfortunately, a lot of organizations are not well understood and well documented, and that itself creates security breaches. Remember the security of your organization is just as good as the as the as the weakest link you have, right? And we've seen you know examples after examples of how the breach came in through a cash register software, the breach came in through some Wi-Fi network, the breach came in through a printer, the breach came in through a old router which had not been updated to the latest firmware. You don't know where the or the breach came in most commonly through some phishing email which somebody clicked on because they thought they had, you know, some Nigerian prince was contacting them, uh, then them with some money finally. Uh, you know, they've been waiting for it their entire life. But you don't know where the breach will come from. And all these interrelated systems need to be protected at equal levels. No system in today's interconnected world is less important than the other one when it comes to security. So last, uh, you know, to end my session, I would like to, you know, talk about this new area which is coming uh, and, you know, called security chaos engineering. And, you know, the origins of security chaos engineering uh, actually do not go back to Netflix, right? They go back to, uh, you know, a person named Aaron Reinhardt, who is today the CTO of, of a company called Verica, which is focused on, uh, you know, on, on security chaos engineering and chaos engineering in general. But, uh, you know, uh, Netflix was the company that created this term security chaos engineering in, in the context of, of, of engineering, right? Chaos theory and chaos has in general principles have been around for a very long time. If you've ever seen, you know, a, a movie where there, there's a pilot running to fly or an astronaut not, you know, training, uh, you know, they'll always say, okay, let's kill this motor or kill this engine or introduce a, a, some wind shear uh, to see how the pilot will react. Guess what they're doing? They're doing chaos engineering, right, to train the pilot so that he or she is ready for all, all uh, you know, uh, uh, things that can go wrong while they are flying a plane or, 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 in, or a spaceship. But the same thing we're talking about in, in engineering, right? And this is the best example uh, analogy I've heard is, right, how do you know you can change the tire of your car uh, you know, if you have a have a flat tire on a dark, stormy night, on a cold night, where you know, on a highway where there's no cell cell phone reception and it's raining like crazy and it's there's no light, right? How do you know you can do that? Well, the only way you can be confident of doing that is if every Sunday night you pull your car into outside, you uh, turn off all the lights, you have your kids throw cold water on you with buckets, then you take a screwdriver, poke a hole in your tire, and then change it and see how effectively you can do it. If you do that every Sunday, if every tiny time you have a flat tire on a stormy night on a lonely mountain road, you know you can change it, right? That's the thinking behind chaos engineering. Security chaos engineering is basically says that you do that with security incidents, right? You look for all the things that could go wrong and you experiment with that. You do uncontrolled experiments in order to determine where the weaknesses in your systems are and you fix them. And the chaos is real. You know, you might have seen this report, this came from Sophos, they did a honeypot attempt, which is they put unprotected, uh, you know, uh, virtual machines around in various regions around the world and looked at how quickly would people, they get hacked, right? For those of you in India, look at the Mumbai thing. It took 55 seconds, 55.11 seconds for it to be breached before people started attempting, right, to, to get to it. These are, these are seconds, guys, not minutes, right? And, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, before the first login attempt, right? So, sorry, this is minutes, right? So, it was 55 minutes. Man, people in Mumbai are slow, man. It took almost an hour to find it, right? Look at us, the people in Sao Paulo, man. Come on, step it up, India. 52 seconds it was hacked in Sao Paulo, Brazil, man. Come on, man, India, we can, we can do better. Ireland, one hour, 44 minutes, right? I guess, well, I shall leave it at that. Uh, but Mumbai, we need to step up, man, uh, and see if we can, you know, this is not good. How can we be so far down there? But anyway, I, I joke, right? But at the end of the day, what that means is that if you put something which can be breached, it'll get breached. 
sooner or later. Security chaos engineering essentially says that I have a discipline of running, the discipline of running instrumented controlled experiments by which I can examine the, the security of all my systems continuously in production or a production-like environment. Trust me, not everybody is ready to do things in production and not everybody can. If you're in a regulated environment or if you're dealing with financial instruments or mission-critical systems or life-saving systems, you don't want to do this chaos engineering in production. You do it in a production-like environment you know, uh, and you're looking for where there can be possible breaches in your security posture. And you know there are there are implementation principles which are there. You need to obviously no have end to end instrumentation. It's no good running the experiments if you cannot monitor and detect and observe what's happening. So very good instrumentation is needed. You need to be continuously doing this, not a one time thing. Right? You can start off with some tabletop exercise. Eventually, you got to exercise it in in production and say if you uh, somebody does a DDoS attack, what happens? If somebody tries to breach you by using cross scripting, what happens? Various you know. Uh, at, typical attempts of hacking, you know, what happens to your system. And this is for all levels of the system, not just in production. You do this for your non-production system also. Can a test environment get breached? And if it does, what can they get, right? If your data is all sent, all, all obfuscated, they're not going to get much, right? Again, we've got to talk about automation when it comes to identity management, def, you know, you know, patching. Uh, and, you know, there, and I'll leave you, to, you know, to read this and, and you know, you can, you can look it up and read in more detail. The Chaos Engineering book, which just came out, uh, uh, has an entire chapter written by Aaron Reinhardt, uh, you know, uh, on, on chaos, uh, security chaos engineering. So I, I leave you, you know, in interest of time to go read that chapter and, and look it up. And if you, if you just go look, you know, Google Aaron Reinhardt, you'll find uh, all his, a lot of his writings on this topic and uh, the various talks he's given in this space. So, in, so to close this out, let's talk about where do you start, right? So, okay, Sanjeev, this is great. I need to democratize security. I need to empower my practitioners. I need to do security chaos engineering. I agree with all of you, where do you start? Well, to, to start anything, you need to do two things. The first thing you need to do is identify your point B, right? Where do you, what is your destination? Where do you want to get to, right? What is your end goal here, right? And map that out. Understand that very well from a business perspective because that will help you create the roadmap on how to get there. And that also includes things like your budget. You know, what, what risk are you willing to take because, you know, nobody can protect against everything all the time, right? By definition, you cannot protect against zero-day vulnerabilities because they are unknown, right? All the unknown ones, right? The moment they are known, yes, you want to fix them. But what is your budget and how quickly how, how quickly do you want to get there? And then you want to identify where are you, your point A, right? Once you know point B and you know point A, you can create a roadmap. And trust me, it won't be a straight line. And what I do when I'm working with clients is, and this is irrespective of whether I'm focusing on DevOps or security or or, or, or cloud is I, I like to do a value stream mapping of their application delivery pipelines. And so I take some exemplar pipelines and look at how assets flow all the way from requirement, all the way to code running in production and getting feedback and look at who are all the stakeholders who are involved. How do those assets and artifacts go from one stakeholder to the next? What environments do they use? What tools do they use? What processes do they use? And what you're looking for is three things. You're looking for where is the waste? Where is the wait states? Where is people are waiting for something, somebody else to do something? And where is the rework? And in secure, when you're doing this in context of security, and I can do this in context of data, I recently did one at a, at a bank where I did this in context of data, right? So every when I looked at waste, wait, as wait states and rework, I'm like, we captured everything, but then for the context of my exercise, my workshop, we looked at where the waste was data related, where the wait states were data related, and where the rework was data related. So in the context of security, when I do this, I'm looking at, okay, where is the waste that's security related? Are there tasks I'm having to do, like doing some checklists or filling out some forms, which can be automated? That's waste. That's waste of time, right? Security needs to empower me to do it. Am I opening a ticket with, with the InfoSec team and having them run a vulnerability test on a container? And it takes them three days to get to it because they're busy, not because they don't want to, because they're busy, they have a backlog. They could have just empowered me to run the vulnerability test, right? So that's a wait state which can be eliminated. And rework, where I do something, then the InfoSec team punts it back to me and says, you did it wrong, do it again, now do it with these requirements because, again, I'm not empowered, it's not democratized. That's rework. So waste, wait, and rework can be eliminated from a security context if you know what they are. And as you create this value stream mapping, right, and, and you know, here's an example on this, on that whiteboard picture you have, and trust me, those of you who know me know that is not my handwriting. My handwriting can only be read by, 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 by you know, pharmacists. It is so horrible. 
uh, this is done by a good colleague of mine and I used his example uh, instead of mine because you couldn't have read mine. It was like all over the place. Uh, but, you know, you look, you, look, you look across the value stream mapping workshop, uh, across the value stream and you're looking for waste, weight and rework. Once you know where the waste, weight and rework are, and if you're talking in context of security, you can then create a remediation plan to say, how can I address this? And you have to work with your infosec teams. This cannot be done by the application delivery teams without your security teams involved, right? Security teams have to be engaged while you're doing the value stream mapping exercise. So they understand and they can give their input as to why things are the way they are. There are certain things they will not change because they are not willing to give up that responsibility or cannot give up that responsibility. Or they don't know that there is a way that they can keep the responsibility but give control within with those guardrails to you. So, you know, if you are collaborating with them, you can get to that state. So here, so that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about today. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, I will leave you some contact information, right? If you're attending this session and would like to talk to me more about DevOps or DevSecOps or cloud adoption in general, if you go to the URL, which uh, which is there on my blog, you can go to sdarchitect.blog or just scan this QR code and it'll take you straight to my Calendly. I'm giving 30 minute, uh, you know, free sessions, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one sessions to anybody who would love to chat more. Now, please, when you go to Calendly and ask for a 30 minute session, please write down what you want to talk about, right? And I know, you know, these are tough times. We are in the middle of lockdowns, you know, off and on all over the world. Uh, and I would love to help you with your, with your job search, but these 30 minutes are not for that. I've had to, you know, decline them. Uh, people are asking for help. If you need help, email me, you know, DM me on Twitter, right? If you need help, if you need, a, if you see I have a connection on LinkedIn, you would like to be introduced to, to help you with your job search. I'd be more than happy to do that, but let's not use these 30 minutes for that. And right? these are not, you know, uh, for career guidance. Like let's, you know, get, you know, communicate via email or Twitter or DMs uh, regarding career. This is to specifically talk about DevSecOps and the topics you heard me present and talk about today. I'd be more than happy to have a conversation with you. You can also email me as here it is, check out my blog. And, uh, you know, check out accelerated strategies, right? I'm not the only, uh, you know, analyst there. There's a whole team of us with various skills and backgrounds. In fact, we have a very strong cybersecurity uh, presence there with some pretty well-known cybersecurity professionals. So check accelerated strategies out and, you know, click on the team and you'll see all the analysts who are there. And, you know, they all have this 30-minute thing. So you can reach there. Almost all of them have this 30-minute uh, availability. You can click on their Calendly links and ask for time. Uh, well, I hope uh, this session, uh, you know, added some value and gave you the information you were looking for. Uh, and enjoy the rest of DevOps India Summit. It is the largest DevOps conference in India, and I'm very proud to be a part of it. With that, I'll uh, hand it back to the host.